church. Those of you that are here all get gold stars because you came out despite the storm. And uh, we're certainly glad that you're here. And we welcome those who are viewing us on the internet. We are in United Church of Pentecook here in Pentecook, New Hampshire. We're glad that you could join us. This morning I have some brief announcements. First of all, our annual meeting will be next week. And we will have that immediately after the church service. We'll have a little bit of a break so that those who don't want to stay can leave, but it will be immediately after the church service. Point setters can still be purchased. Tomorrow is the last day. You have to go to Marshalls and pay for them there. And uh, if you want them given in memory of somebody, then let the office know, and uh, we will make sure that that gets announced to the congregation that they're given in memory of someone. But we use these point setters to help decorate for the Christmas service. Um, another thing, missions project, we mentioned it last time, uh, I thought we were going to have a display today, but the homeless shelter is who we're supporting as a missions project this year. They are setting up a halfway house, and it's for people who've been homeless, and they're trying to get them um, to learn what it's like to be on your own, to help them get employed help them find a place where they can stay that they can afford. And so that's the whole purpose of this halfway home that they have opened up and we want to help support that effort. And we do have new copies of Daily Bread that are still available out before you. So I think that's it for announcements this morning. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to worship you. Lord, we thank you for those who've gone before us and provided this great house of worship for us to be here. We pray for those who aren't able to make it. We ask your being to be upon them, strengthen them, keep them safe, protected. And Lord, we pray that the joy of our being here today would be a sweet sound in your ear and that our joy would change us for having been here with you. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. Let's sing together. Joy to the world.
these old standards. We love to sing them. Um, came in a little bit later. You'll get your gold star later for being here and being weathered the storm. So. Now one that's a little bit newer that we sang last week, Wonderful Council. <clears throat> Lives, just as you've changed our lives. And Lord, that's what we ask. 
that you bless our giving this day. In Jesus' name. You may remain seated, but let's sing Old Little Town of Bethlehem. Mary 
responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. And later, verse 46 to 49, the magnificent Mary's song of praise. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord! How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior! For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy, and he has done great things for me. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come today, we praise you for your power. We praise you for your majesty. We praise you for your love and your mercy that you pour out into our lives. For you've created us and you chose to create us in your very image so that we can know you and live in relationship with you. How great is that? Such tremendous blessing. And thank you for the beauty of creation that you've put us in. Lord, as we come, the nation and the world is still in fear of this COVID sickness. Our people are anxious about this past election and racial tensions are still high. We would pray and ask that you would bring your peace. Bring your peace upon us. Continue to protect those who are ministering to the sick. Bring healing to those who are ailing. Comfort to those who are grieving. And we would pray that you would end this pandemic. End especially all the fear that it has caused. Would you allow churches across the land to be open so that they can receive the people whose hearts are turned to you in the midst of this panic and fear. We would pray that schools can open across the nation. Enable small businesses to survive, to be open, bring an end to all these shutdowns of panic. Lord, within our own church family, we pray for those who are vulnerable, protect them, keep them safe from sickness. Continue to strengthen Tracy, pray. Be with the winters as they continue to minister to her. The Tracy will be prepared for her next procedure. The time is right. Give the doctors wisdom about that. Continue to pray, Lord, for Noreen Shatek's protection, for her well-being. We pray for others. We're in fear, Lord. Pray that this vaccine that's coming will be effective so that people need not have this fear and they can return to church to be here to worship you. Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with financial situations right now, who are struggling, that you'll provide the answers, you'll provide the resources, you'll meet their needs as they trust in you. Lord, for our church, we pray that this is a church that grows, that makes a difference in this community. We thank you for our opportunities to host the pantry that feeds people, that we host the meals, the community, Mondays and Wednesdays, we ask your blessings on all those who are involved in those ministries. Lord, this time of year, would you soften people's hearts to hear and be impacted by the good news of Jesus Christ. You're stepping into the world for sinners such as us. We ask your blessings upon us now. Open us up to your message today. In Christ's name.
to say, here's what God's plan is for your life. He didn't say anything to her about joy and gladness. In part because pregnancy for an unmarried girl was very problematic, much more so than it would have been for a barren, older woman like Elizabeth. Oh yes, Elizabeth's world, I'm sure, was turned upside down having a child at her age. But still, God changed Mary's world dramatically. And here's the thing, we can learn much from her response to God's telling her that she would have this child. In the passage that we read earlier from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, and then later, as she praised God in verses 46 to 49. You see, Gabriel comes to this young Mary, who's engaged to marry Joseph. Joseph, who's a descendant of David, except here's the thing, it wasn't really such a big deal back then, because David had a lot of descendants. A lot of descendants none of whom had ruled on the throne of Israel for hundreds of years. Because Herod, even the king of Judea at the time, wasn't a Jew. Matter of fact, he gained his kingship from Rome. But Joseph, we learn elsewhere, was a carpenter, which means he had a profession, so chances are they weren't actually poverty-stricken. And yet, Scripture indicates that neither Mary nor David other than Joseph came from families of any prominence. Meaning they were just ordinary folk like you and like me. Yet Gabriel appears and he says, Greetings, favorite woman. The Lord is with you. And we know his sudden appearance scares the living daylights out of her because in the next verse, in verse 30, the angel says, Don't be afraid, Mary. While other versions say, she was disturbed, that she was confused, and even puzzled by Gabriel's greeting and telling her she'd found favor with God. Some translations say she found grace. It's an expression that's used over 40 times in the Old Testament, one that shows how God showered his amazing grace on Mary and giving her something that she didn't deserve in using her to give birth to the coming Messiah. A grace that Gabriel expanded on in verses 31 to 33. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He'll be very great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. You know, last week we saw how Zechariah responded to the angel, telling him that he and his wife were going to have a child at their advanced age. You recall, he asked for some kind of sign in order to believe what the angel was saying. Mary didn't ask for a sign. She was simply confused and she didn't understand how this could happen to her. In verse 34, she asked, but how can it happen I'm a virgin? Now this is a question that shows that she understood that Joseph was not to be the father of this child. As Gabriel went on in verse 35 to explain the miracle of it all. In saying the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy, and he'll be called the Son of God. But the important thing is, do you see how Mary responded? She responded with humility. That's the example. God used her in a mighty way. And if we want to be used by God, we too need to respond to God with humility. Because in verse 38, she didn't say, you got to be kidding me, the angel. Is this some kind of prank? Where's the cameras? No, she didn't say any of that. She merely said, I am your servant. In verse 38, she made no demand. She made no conditions. She humbly replied, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you've said about me come true. She didn't present her plan for her life to God and expect him to just bless it. She accepted God's plan and her role in it. She exhibited neither the pride of worthiness or the pride of protest. 
Because she realized God is God and God has the right to do whatever he chooses to do. As Douglas Rumford says, humility knows how to say, I am a servant, without degrading itself. Humility knows how to say, I was wrong, without self-despising. Humility knows how to say, please forgive me, without groveling. Humility knows how to say, let me have another chance to make things right. You know, Bruce Shields tells the story of a tourist in Paris who went into a small, out-of-the-way shop and bought a rather inexpensive necklace to bring home to his wife. And he was surprised, though, when it came to customs, that they charged him such a high tax on it to bring it into the country. So it made him curious. So as soon as he got back home, he took it to a jeweler to have it appraised. The jeweler looked at it under a magnifying glass and meekly said, I'll offer you $25,000 for this necklace, as is. Well, that really made him curious. So he took it to another jeweler to be praised. He too looked at it under a magnifying glass and offered him $10,000 more than the first jeweler did. And so the guy asked, well, what's so valuable? What is it you're seeing? He said, look through the magnifying glass, sir. And as he did, he read, Napoleon Bonaparte, given to Josephine. You see, its value wasn't in its appearance. It wasn't in its condition. It was in its identification with a famous person. Like how knowing Jesus makes us special. New creations, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17, Suggesting we're not self-made people, we are God-made people. Our worth, our real value comes from our relationship with the Lord. Because when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.28, God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important, he went on to explain how you and I, we have nothing to brag about on our own except our relationship. God. Because apart from Jesus, we have nothing to brag about. But with Jesus, we're different people than others in the world. And so like Mary, if we want to experience all that God wants for us, toward making a difference in the lives of others, to be able to influence our children and our grandchildren, our friends and our neighbors, we can't approach Him with our own desires and our own dreams. What we need to do is search His will for our lives. Seek what He wants for us and then accept it. Which leads to learning how our response to God should include our availability, just as it did for Mary. Our availability. Because while much has been written about Mary down through the centuries, Scripture doesn't actually say a lot about her. That's right. Except that God took the initiative to work in and through her as she made herself available to him as his servant. Or as the King James Version says, she considered herself the handmaiden of the Lord. Something which should give all of us hope. Because it says people don't need to spend all their time making something of themselves before they come to God to ask Him to use them. But all God wants is our availability. When we make ourselves available to Him, He can use us, even the lowest of servants, to do great things. Because when you think about it, Mary was close to the bottom of the social scale. Being a woman who was pregnant outside of marriage, and only being pledged to Mary, leading some scholars to believe she may have been as young as 12 or 13 years of age. A mere teen who had no status, influence in Jewish society of the day. Yet God elevated her, used her to do something great in this unfolding plan of salvation for the world. And that's a great contrast to what we see in a program like American Idol, right? You're familiar with the premise of the show?
thousands audition to be on that program every year. From the Big Apple to Chicago and up and down the West Coast. It's been said that they have so many people that audition, they have to put their names in a hat to choose who will do it because of the limited time. But all these people want the opportunity to go before the judges. Katy Perry, Luke Bryan, Lionel Richie. The humorous part comes in the early stages, though, if you've ever watched the program. When there are contestants who, well, they're just not aware of their lack of talent, which is so blindingly obvious to everyone else. But the contrast that I've referred to is if you take that same premise and make God the judge. When you audition, tell him, here I am, Lord, willing and ready for you to use. Mary's story shows that when you make yourself available to God, he won't belittle your talent. He'll reward your availability. Just join Isaiah and say, here I am, Lord, send me. Isaiah 6, 8. God will put you to work. And after a lifetime of labor for him, you will hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now go, enjoy your reward. You know, former concentration camp prisoner, a world traveling evangelist, Corey Ten Boom, once said that God has no hands but ours. The expression she further explained by going on to add that God does not ask about our ability or our inability. He asks about our availability. It's not my ability, she claimed, but my response to God's ability that counts. So that's the question this morning. Have you made yourself available for God to use? Have you told Him that you want to be a positive influence in the lives of your children, your grandkids, your friends, for Christ? beyond humility, beyond making yourself available for God to use. Like Mary, if you really want God to use you, again, to make a difference in the lives of those you love, you'll always respond in obedience to Him. You'll always respond in obedience. Something seen in how Mary responded to God's angel. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you've said about me come true. Consider the magnitude of the obedience that she displayed. For God's will in her life, she miraculously conceived the world's Savior. She was a young teen from a small town in an enemy-occupied territory because the Romans occupied the land. And she was already preparing to leave the protection of her parents to start a new life with a future husband. And we can't know exactly how she felt but we can imagine that she was already thinking about how she's going to explain her condition to her future husband, Joseph. But somehow she'd gotten pregnant. Would he believe her? Especially when she said that God was directly responsible for her condition. Did she worry about the loss of reputation she was about to suffer from family? from friends, and given that she was in the small village of Nazareth, basically from everyone in town. Yet she proved to be obedient through it all, even to the point of singing praises to God for choosing the humble to be the agents of his love. In the face of what she knew she was about to endure. Does it sound easy? Except the story does explain why Mary knew she could do it. Explains the reason for her confidence. Because the angel told her, God looked upon her with what? With favor. The word in the original text from the Greek, it's also translated as grace. That's why you often hear the expression, Hail Mary, full of grace. Which suggests she was already reacting to the gift God's amazing grace when she responded to the angel, when she reacted to the news. And what does scripture teach us about God's grace? 
Well, the first two chapters of Ephesians, we learn much from the Apostle Paul. He writes, and scholars feel and interpret what he writes as saying, God's grace is synonymous with God's power. In that grace is the impact of having the Holy Spirit dwell within a believer. This explains why 1 Corinthians 15.10 is where Paul would write, but whatever I am now, it's all because God poured out his special favor on me. The NIV text reads, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I but God who was working through me by his grace. You know, I was thinking about how do I illustrate grace? And I remember that when our sons were very young and they were first learning to eat by themselves, you know, they were at the age where they got more applesauce on their chin, sides of their mouth, up on their nose than they did actually in their mouth. I remember watching Del take her hand and just gently put it on our son's little hand. And then with as little pressure as possible, she would help guide our son's spoon into his mouth. Great illustration of grace. As Elizabeth Elliot has said that grace <laughs> I've gotten ahead of myself here. Grace is God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It's God doing graciously for us what we cannot do. So together with what Paul said about God's grace, we can understand it as the power and ability of God that flows out of the Holy Spirit being present in our lives. It operates through us so we can fully accomplish everything that God calls us to do in this life for Him. While at the same time, God's grace is what changes us. It's what transforms us from the inside out and makes us ever more like Jesus. That's God's plan for us, according to Romans 8 29. A grace that allows us to know and be confident that God is with us every step of the way, that He won't lead us any place that He doesn't enable us to go. It causes us to know, according to 1 Corinthians 10 13. God will never allow us to be tested beyond what he knows we can bear. As long as you rely on him, whatever life throws at you, no matter how tough it is, you can always get more of God's grace as you go to him. As 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God promised you'll always find his grace to be sufficient for you. Grace, God's power, it comes at no cost to you to do through you what you cannot do yourself. Here's the question. Have you lived life without giving much thought to wanting to be a positive influence for the Lord on the lives of those you love? Well, the story is told about two robins who were out scouting for food. They finally came to a field that was filled with worms and they started to eat. And they had themselves a feast, and they ate, and they ate, and they ate. And pretty soon they were so full, one robin said to the other, I don't think I can even fly back up into the tree. The other robin agreed. So pretty much they just sat there, basking in the sun, and fell asleep. As you can imagine, pretty soon an old cat came along, gobbled those robins right up. And with a grin said, there's nothing I like better than Baskin Robbins. <laughs> but seriously, are you just basking through life? Because life is too short, it's too important to just miss out on what Mary discovered about being a positive difference on being able to impact those around you. Because when she humbled herself, when she made herself available, when she responded to God's calling with obedience, God used Mary to make a difference. A difference in the world. For Mary's example, God will use you too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> you 
You've spoken to our hearts today. If we're serious about wanting to make a difference in the lives of those we love, to want to see them in heaven with us, Lord, lead us to be humble, to be available, open our eyes up to the opportunities to share Jesus. Help us to be obedient to your calling, to whom you call us to witness to, so that we can be effective in reaching those we love for you. This is our prayer this morning. We ask it now in Jesus' precious name. stand and sing a communion hymn for Christmas.
Presbyterian United Church, we practice what's called open communion. You don't need to be a member in order to participate. But we do ask because of the warnings of Scripture that you have placed your faith in Jesus. We're glad that you're here today. And I saw a commercial the other day that had a reference to Scrooge in it. And it got me to thinking. You know, in that Christmas classic we're all familiar with, he had a visit from the ghost of Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future. Well, we are guided by the Holy Ghost. And as such, I got to thinking about what about Christmas past? Well, the Christmas past that we really celebrate is what Jesus has done for us. And that he came into the sin-stained world. He grew up. He had a ministry of healing people, calling people to know the Lord. And then he died in our place to take the punishment we deserve upon himself. As Hebrews 9.14 says, For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And then I get to thinking about Christmas present. And that would be Jesus' invitation to have a relationship with him. As you recall, he said, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Christmas present is about continuing his work in the world, too. As John 14, 12, he said, Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works. And that's his work of bringing people to God. That's the important ministry we've been given. Because as Jesus came into the world, born in a stable, he now invites us to his table as a fellowship of believers, as if we're present with Jesus during his final meal with his disciples. But here's the thing, when we begin to think about Christmas future, we know that that was not his final meal when he met with the disciples in the upper room. And they shared what they thought was going to be a traditional Passover meal. Because Christmas future is about Jesus' promise to return for us to be able to share the marriage feast of the Lamb with him in heaven, in paradise, as he comes to take us to be where he is. As Christmas past is about being forgiven, Christmas present is about his being present with us, and Christmas future is for us to be with him for all of eternity. But as Jesus met with his disciples in that last meeting, and he led them, he would have been the one to lift the bread to say the traditional blessing, to break it. But he changed the meaning of Passover. As he turned to his disciples, he said, Take, eat, this represents my body, broken for you. Let us pray and give thanks for the body of Christ. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the blessing of giving yourself up so that we can live with you for all of eternity. <coughs> Lord, what an amazing grace what a sacrifice, the pain that you suffered, not just the pain of the nails, but the pain of having God turn his back on you as you there were in the darkness, hanging on the cross. You suffered hell in our place. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us eat together in remembrance of him.
now for eternity. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Let us drink together in remembrance of him. Thank you, Lord, for the supreme gift. Thank you for giving your all for such as us. Thank you for your boundless love that would come to die for sinners such as us. Lord, to redeem us, to be with you for eternity. You are a great and awesome, awesome God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand together and sing boundless love.